We've been using the M1 MacBook Pro quite extensively for over a month now, and I'm finally ready to gather all of my thoughts and conclusions into a long-term review. And the way I want to do it is to look at the general consensus about the transition to Apple Silicon before Apple actually revealed them, and then look at the reality of the M1 MacBook Pro after just one month. So brace yourselves, because this is about to be the most comprehensive review you've probably seen. Way back in June and July, shortly after Apple's announcement, a lot of people were doubting this transition. One user said that we would have to wait at least two years before the new chip would be a good option. Another one said, in no way will the R Mac have both more power and more battery life. If you're into programming, I would 100% buy an Intel Mac versus wait for ARM. I don't think they'll have a powerful MacBook Pro level processor until 2022. Just look at all of those negative comments about the transition. But wait, it gets even worse when we take a look at the gaming outlook. Gaming is coming, but it won't be anything but mobile games unless a real dedicated GPU is on board. Rest in peace gaming on a Mac machine. MacBooks won't get AAA games. Our Macs will not be real computers. Reading those comments today is hilarious because as we all know, they were completely wrong and I'll show you guys just how wrong they were in just a couple of minutes. So now let's get into the reality of the M1 MacBook Pro after just one month. And I'm gonna be focusing on answering the three main doubts about the Apple Silicon transition. The M1 Max having weak performance, the software transition being incredibly bumpy, especially for x86 apps, and lastly, Apple Silicon being the death of AAA gaming on the Mac. But before I get into that, I want to quickly cover the actual MacBook Pro itself in terms of the design. It's basically the same as it was before, still being more premium, thin, and light than a lot of other laptops. The new Magic Keyboard is amazing with no reliability issues like we had with the Butterfly Keyboard. The speakers continue to blow away every other Windows laptop out there. The new studio quality microphones sound really good and natural, and the new image signal processor in the M1 chip has actually greatly improved the webcam quality, even though it's 720p. Yes, it's not the 1080p webcam that we were hoping for, but look at how it compares to the latest webcam from the Dell XPS. It destroys it. And the Force Touch trackpad is still, hands down, the best trackpad ever made. Now, while we didn't get the redesign that we were hoping for, it still looks great with a 13-inch display that's still on par with even the latest Windows laptops like the XPS 13. And keep in mind that next year's 14-inch MacBook Pro will have a full redesign with a new mini LED display, which will be class-leading in every way. It's also going to have an even better chip, which I believe is going to blow people's minds. But for now, let's answer the first doubt that people had before the M1 Max were revealed, and that's the performance. To do this, I'm going to show off some of our results from our M1 MacBook Pro versus 16-inch base MacBook Pro comparison video. In terms of Geekbench 5 CPU test, the M1 absolutely blew it away, especially in single core performance. And even in Cinebench R23, which tests throttling over a 10 minute test, the M1 was actually faster. For graphics, the M1's integrated GPU was performing surprisingly close to the dedicated 5300M in the 16 inch. Even in the GFX Bench Gaming benchmark, the 16 inch was only 12% faster. But here's the kicker. The M1's GPU was only using 5.6 watts, while the 5300M was using a massive 45 watts. Now moving on to some more tests, I'm also gonna add in some of the other Intel Macs that we tested for some extra context. In the Logic Pro stress test, the M1 absolutely destroyed the previous Intel MacBook Pro and was surprisingly not too far behind the latest 8-core iMac. But by far the biggest improvement that we saw was in our MaxTech Xcode benchmark, with the M1 Max 
outperforming our $15,000 Mac Pro, which we did not expect at all. And making it even more crazy, we tested Lightroom Classic, which was running under Rosetta 2. The M1 MacBook Pro finished the export test faster than the 16 inch which basically nobody was expecting when Apple announced the transition. And then moving on to Final Cut Pro, the M1 beat the 16 inch by around 30 seconds in our 4K five minute export test. And it was only around five seconds slower than the eight core iMac. And the best part is that the M1 Macs are able to play back very tough Canon R5 footage with no issues, while even our Mac Pro can't handle it due to having older hardware decoders. And in terms of transcoding speed, the M1 Macs blow away every single Intel Mac. Now here's my favorite part. After about three and a half hours of shooting that M1 versus 16 inch comparison video, the 16 inch was left with 3% battery life and the M1 had 67% battery life, which is absolutely mind blowing. So we're not only getting much better performance than even a base 16 inch MacBook Pro, but we're also getting many times better battery life as well. And that's been the general consensus with new owners of M1 Max. Many of them are absolutely blown away by the battery life. And to make it even better, you can hardly ever hear the fan on the M1 MacBook Pro, while the 16 inch has two of them and they were blaring for many of the tests in that video. And if you're wondering why, here's an absolute shocker. The M1 Pro CPU took only 13 watts of power under full sustained load compared to 67 watts on the 16 inch. So in reality, it makes total sense why the fan on the M1 rarely ever gets loud. Now this also gives the M1 Max a huge advantage over Windows laptops since you can use it unplugged and get full performance while many other laptops like the Dell XPS slow down significantly in the interest of saving battery life. Making it even more interesting, we did a RAM stress test between the 16 gig M1 MacBook Pro and the 16 gig Dell XPS 13. And to our surprise, the M1 wouldn't budge. We ran a bunch of tasks in the background and then ran our Lightroom export test, which is hugely dependent on RAM. And as you can see, the M1 Mac barely slowed down while the XPS took almost twice as long to finish the export. So this shows that Apple's unified memory is incredibly efficient and it almost acts like it has more RAM than it actually does. So we've been recommending most people to simply get the eight gigabyte model unless you know that you really need 16. This was actually a hugely controversial issue because people were saying that the swap memory would damage the SSD even in the span of just a few months, but that's really misleading. Swap memory didn't magically appear with M1 Max. Apple's been doing this for years and even Windows computers do this as well. If this was a huge deal, then older MacBooks would have major SSD issues, but they've proven to be incredibly reliable and so will the M1 Max. Now let's get into the second doubt that people had before the M1 Max were released and that's software support. Rosetta 2 has proven to run almost every x86 app that most people use right out of the gate, and it's only been getting better as macOS Big Sur has been getting updated over the past month. The biggest issues people are still having is with certain plugins, like Motion VFX for Final Cut Pro, which do have to get updated to Apple Silicon, but other than that, everything runs impressively fast iPhone and iPad apps are now running very well with full screen support, so there are no issues with that. But I've been absolutely blown away at the speed at which developers are updating apps for Apple Silicon. After just a month, Microsoft's full office suite has been updated with native Apple Silicon support. Firefox, Chrome, and Microsoft Edge have already been updated with full support for M1 Max, along with Visual Studio Code, Python, IntelliJ IDEA, Adobe Lightroom, and both Docker 
and Parallel 16 are now getting their first tech previews. These professional apps are getting updated much sooner than I thought they would, and it's starting to feel like this is causing more and more pressure on other developers to update their apps for Apple Silicon, especially since the performance is so promising. This is extremely exciting because at this rate, a lot of the most popular apps should have native Apple Silicon support by the time we get the next wave of higher end Macs next year. So all of the previous doubts about the transition being bumpy in terms of the software for the first couple of years are completely wrong because it's only been one month and the software support is good enough right now that most people can upgrade without any issues. So hats off to Apple and many developers for pulling that off in such a short time. One of the major controversies surrounding the M1 MacBooks was the very limited display support, but we've already seen users running six displays off of an M1 Mac using hubs, adapters, and special software. Someone else was able to get a 4K display running at 144 hertz and with HDR enabled at the same time using an external hub. So those who require better display support can get more displays running if they really need to. But in reality, most people buying an entry-level MacBook don't even use one external display in the first place. And now let's move on to answering the final doubt about the Apple Silicon transition, and that's people believing that AAA gaming on the Mac is going away. But before I get into how impressive the gaming support has been in just the first month of the very first weakest Apple Silicon Mac chip that will ever be made, I want to give you guys some context. In the past, 13-inch Intel MacBooks in the Mac Mini required an eGPU to get decent gaming performance, which is another $700 on top of buying the Mac itself, and the fans would always be crazy loud as well. I even tested the 2020 Intel MacBook Air with an eGPU and the performance was absolutely terrible because the CPU was literally at 100 degrees Celsius the entire time even though the powerful eGPU was taking care of the graphics load. So AAA gaming was basically impossible on a MacBook Air, and for the MacBook Pro and Mac Mini, an eGPU was an absolute must. The main advantage was bootcamp support for playing Windows games, which the M1 Macs unfortunately don't have anymore, and that's mainly what led to comments saying rest in peace gaming on a Mac machine, but thankfully, they're dead wrong. After people actually got their hands on these new M1 Macs, it's been the complete opposite. I'm gonna take a bold stance and say that the M1 chip is the beginning of the revival of AAA gaming on the Mac. An entire community has been thriving on the Mac gaming subreddit where people are sharing their excitement for playing games on M1 Macs. People are now using Rosetta to get very impressive performance in games like Black Ops 3, Baldur's Gate 3, Hades, and Civilization 6 on a MacBook Air with no throttling issues at all. I myself was able to play games like Minecraft, CSGO, Diablo 3, Fortnite, and League of Legends using Rosetta with better performance than I ever expected, and the fans barely went above idle, sitting at around 2000 RPM. Going even further, users have been using Crossover 20, which installs and emulates Windows apps and games on the Mac, and they're getting awesome performance in games like Resident Evil 3, Age of Empires 2, Rocket League, Metro Exodus, and much more. I myself used Crossover to play Witcher 3, which is the number one search result when you Google best AAA games, and I was able to get great performance at slightly higher than 1080p resolution. On top of that, people have been enjoying iPad games on their MacBooks like Tropico. One user was even able to run both Grand Theft Auto 3 and Vice City at the same time. I personally ran four iPad games at once, being able to easily switch between them and then take one game into full screen mode with no issues. And even running four games, the M1 didn't break a sweat. 
Other users on Reddit have also started using emulators to play games like Zelda Ocarina of Time, New Super Mario Bros., and Mario Kart with better than expected performance. I even used the fanless 7 core MacBook Air to play World of Warcraft, which is currently the only AAA game which is fully updated for Apple Silicon, and I was able to get a minimum of 60 FPS in dungeons, with the graphics settings turned down. And to my surprise, the CPU temps were incredibly cool, even without a fan, showing just how promising the future of Mac gaming can be when more games come with Apple Silicon support in the future, like the game studio Feral Games, which will support M-Series chips for every future game they make. So the fact of the matter is that most, if not all, of the doubt surrounding gaming on Apple Silicon Macs is basically gone, and now the comments have changed. Here's a Reddit post where someone was playing an iPad game on an M1 Mac in full screen. Someone asked if this is only possible on M1 Max, and when he got the answer, yes, he replied, sad. There's a video of someone playing Fallout 4 using crossover on the M1 MacBook Air, and one of the comments said, wow, on a MacBook Air? That smooth? Someone else made a post saying, I just got my M1 MacBook Air, which game should I try first? This is quite ironic because nobody has ever said that about an Intel MacBook Air, and it's the complete opposite of what people were thinking just two months ago. Now the biggest drawback of the M1 Max still remains, the lack of bootcamp support, because the current version of Crossover can't even run some games like Call of Duty Warzone and Cyberpunk 2077, but thankfully, there's a silver lining. People have already figured out ways to run Windows on M1 Max using QEMU, and surprisingly, it runs much faster than Microsoft's own Surface Pro X, which is hilarious. And others are now showing off games like MapleStory running using this method. But making it even better, Parallel 16 for M1 Max is now finally available through the Windows Insider program, and the performance is very promising. Martin Nobel ran Geekbench 5 using Parallels, and he got 1475 for the single core and 5093 for the multi core, which is close to Intel's 11th gen i7 CPU and the latest Dell XPS 13. And after only two days, one user showed off Parallels gameplay on his base M1 MacBook Air, playing games like Far Cry 3 at an average of 45 FPS, Rocket League at around 50 to 70 FPS, and Trackmania Turbo at 70 to 90 FPS. Others were even able to get games like Half-Life 2 to run with great looking frame rates, along with Counter-Strike Source, Assassin's Creed, and Elite Dangerous, getting 50 to 60 FPS on high settings. This is extremely impressive because it's not just parallels running, but Windows is also emulating these x64 games at the same time, and we're actually getting playable performance, and all of this has happened within the first month since these new M1 Macs have been released. Now the funny thing is that when I made that video back in July about Apple Silicon bringing AAA gaming to the Mac, I was honestly thinking that it would take maybe one or two years after the first Macs came out to finally start seeing that happen, but the M1 Macs are literally doing this right now after just one month. The only thing holding them back is the graphics performance, which can't keep up with higher end dedicated graphics chips. But for having integrated graphics, the gaming performance we're getting with the M1 Max is already super impressive. And next year, we're expecting new M1X Max to come with around 16 GPU cores, with potentially twice the graphics performance of these M1 Max. And at that point, those Max will be running AAA games at high settings with excellent frame rates less than one year after the switch to Apple Silicon. One Reddit user made a post saying that Macs are poised to become the number one platform for AAA gaming, and it's crazy that this could actually become a reality thanks to Apple Silicon. So with everything that I discussed in this review, it's clear that Apple's very first M1 Macs 
are blowing away the initial doubts and expectations in basically every way. And I'm willing to bet that when next year's higher end Macs get released, the rest of the industry is going to panic. MacBooks will not only be leading every single battery life comparison chart, but every single performance chart as well. Because of this, Windows laptop makers will be putting immense pressure on Intel and AMD to get high-performance ARM-based chips into laptops as soon as possible. Qualcomm and Samsung will enter the laptop game thanks to their head start in ARM-based chips, and everyone is gonna be putting pressure on Microsoft to heavily invest into improving the ARM version of Windows. In fact, Microsoft is reportedly developing their own ARM-based chips for their servers and Surface PCs, likely in reaction to Apple's success with their very first M1 Max. What we are witnessing right now is the beginning of a personal computing revolution, the likes of which we haven't seen in many years. We just haven't realized it yet. So there you guys go. That was my review of the M1 MacBook Pro. And if you enjoyed it, go ahead and click the circle above to subscribe and check out one of those two videos right over there. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.